Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Recently, the Wall Street Journal published an article about the last person who commissioned a Frank Lloyd Wright home and is still living in it. The house is one of the Usonia homes in Mount Pleasant, New York, not far from my home, and the owner is Roland Reesley. I met Roland a few years ago, and if his status is considered an honor, then there is no better person to obtain this prestige. To put this all in a timeline, the house was built in 1952. Frank Lloyd Wright died in 1959, a few months after I was born. Not that the two incidents are related. So in total, Roland has lived in the house designed for him by Frank Lloyd Wright for over 71 years. Roland has been a great advocate for Frank Lloyd Wright, trying to bring attention to what a nice person he could be and what a positive, life-changing experience it was to work with Wright on their home. He and his wife, Ronnie, met with Wright about 10 times, a few of them in the house. And while some of his written correspondence to Wright included words like anxious and crisis, he found the overall experience pleasant and uplifting. He admits that time has proven the stress to be worth it, and it dampened any unpleasantness that might have occurred. The biggest stress item was apparently the cost of the house, which exceeded their original $20,000 budget and Wright's own $30,000 estimate. But if Wright told them to stretch themselves regarding the cost, they ultimately did. And Rollins says in the long run, it paid off. I found particularly interesting the method by which they told Wright what they wanted. Rowland and Ronnie, a physicist and psychologist respectively, gave him a list of their personal interests the kinds of spaces they would need in the home, and they told Wright what they liked about his other homes, the use of glass, the deep overhangs, and the overall lightness of the building. And then they left the rest up to Wright. Now that's a great client. Some of the correspondences reveal that Wright took such deep interest in this design that he had his associates draw many more iterations than usual causing some concerning delays. Rowland and Ronnie would write back comments to Wright's office and they found Wright's team responsive. Overall, the house took about 10 months to design, which for a great piece of architecture is not bad. Dealing with Wright was overall an agreeable experience. Ronnie said, quote, he was always warm and responsive to me. I resent it when some historians say that Wright's clients were dominated by his personality." End quote. Rowland observed that those who finished their house with Wright were usually very pleased, while those who stopped in the process seem to have had the most complaints. From what I have seen, while Wright did display arrogance, it might be because he was often correct in his vision. And I wondered if much of the bad press he got was due just as much to jealousy as to his temperament. Roland Reesley details all of this in his book, Usonia, New York, Building a Community with Frank Lloyd Wright, particularly in the epilogue about building his own home. As Roland was the official secretary and historian of the Usonia community, it is a very complete and interesting read. Usonia was formed in the middle of the 20th century by an enclave of young people hoping to develop housing differently. They asked the preeminent architect of their era, Frank Lloyd Wright, to bring his genius to Westchester County, New York, just north of the city. In Mount Pleasant, near Pleasantville, New York, Wright devised the now famous circular plot plan, purposely making the spaces between the round lots vaguely public. It differed from the conventional housing development and even Wright's own broad acre city concept because the lots did not abut each other. This kept homeowners from rigidly controlling their site. Indeed, property fences, hedgerows, and the like were forbidden. This allowed the natural wooded hills to retain their original aspects. Usonia was a word used by Wright 
which like a lot of Wright's branded words, had only a vague meaning. It is believed to be derived from USA and is meant to transmit a sense of the American dream, simple and beautiful home ownership. It appears the word was coined earlier by someone else as a more appropriate term for the people in our country rather than the word American. In the end, Frank designed three of the 47 homes in the Usonia Enclave, the other two being the Friedman House, completed in 1950, and the Serlin House, completed in 1951. Wright also designed the addition to the Reesley House, which was completed in time for their third child in 1957. Many other houses at Usonia were designed by his protégés, including David Henkin and Aaron Resnick, both of whom built their own homes at Usonia. Wright served as one of the members of the community's architecture review board to oversee the work of other architects. Wright severely criticized the designs of architect Kanejo Demoto, but they got built anyway. As an aside, Wright protege Aaron Resnick later served on the AIA committee that was giving out college scholarships to high school seniors who were interested in majoring in architecture. I sat in the lobby of the architecture office with the other candidates, all of whom had models of their designs. They had taken drafting, art, and architecture classes. I had not. All I had was a few measly drawings I had done of a set design for my high school's production of My Fair Lady and other drawings of rockets and other miscellaneous things. So I figured I had no chance to get the scholarship. That allowed me to be completely relaxed in the conference room. And I admitted in there that I had not heard of Frank Lloyd Wright until I saw the postage stamp issued in 1966. And even then, I thought he was somehow in the field of aviation, perhaps some sort of relative to Orville or Wilbur Wright. Resnick laughed. I guess they saw something in me because I ended up getting that scholarship. A generation later, along with other AIA architects, I visited Usonia to see all three of Wright's designed houses. We met Roland Reesley at his house, and he was the distinguishing feature on this tour and from all the other Wright buildings I have ever visited because he was an original member of the Usonia Cooperative and an actual client of Frank Lloyd Wright. Two degrees of separation. He talked about how his life was better having lived in the Usonia house. In the Wall Street Journal article, he attributes part of his longevity to the house. On that tour, we architects could not hear enough of Rollins' stories about the design and building process and his interaction with the master, Frank Lloyd Wright. The Reesley House stretches on the outer curve edge of an incline midway up a hill. When the Reesleys were surprised it was not on top of the mound, Wright explained, quote, that would be a house on a hill. To experience the hill, be of the hill, you must build into it, end quote. Only the stone patio walls tied to the chimney jut out of the terrain to create a visually anchored wedge from below. The house has elements of Wright's prairie style with a low profile and deep overhangs, but the jutting patio is similar to Wright's Kentuck Knob in Pennsylvania, cited in Architecture Codex video number 50. Perhaps the most distinguishing design element of the Reesley House is it is laid out with a module of equilateral triangles, so no room has a 90 degree corner, and many rooms are parallelograms. Check your high school geometry book if you're not sure what that means. This separates it from nearly all Wright's other houses, and of course most conventional home design. The equilateral triangle, like the hexagon, and the square is that rare shape that nests completely in a tight pattern. The acute 60 degree corners may contribute to what Roland has described as the comfortably protective nature of the house. It might be like swaddling an infant with tighter spaces with tighter angles and heavy natural materials, hoping somehow to make someone feel contained and secure. The house has higher ceilings than most Wright homes, a request directly from Roland, who is six foot six inches tall, Frank was only five foot seven. This tight rigidity in triangular plan 
is a stark contrast to the Usonia site plan of circles, which purposely made distinguishing one lot from another very ambiguous. The interior aesthetics are derived from natural materials, used simply and expressively. The texture of stone is seen inside and outside the house as a continuous form. Richly hewed cypress wood planking changes direction so the grains and joints create patterns. Eschewing contemporary modernists like Mies or Le Corbusier, Wright did not pursue the glass wall, but carefully framed his windows so they provided visual security to the residents inside. In one visit to the almost finished home, Frank Lloyd Wright sketched out a fireplace grill for the open hearth. Rowland admits that he was sort of nervous about meetings like this. He wasn't sure what you serve to someone like Frank Lloyd Wright. But Frank remained congenial and easygoing about such things. The house was not yet furnished, so they sat on outdoor furniture ordered by Ronnie from Gimbel's. Wright liked them so much he eventually used them elsewhere, even in Taliesin West, Architecture Codex video number 50. For more formal chairs, Wright suggested to the Reesleys that his bad back was from sitting in his own chair designs for too long. He suggested the Reesleys buy nice Scandinavian chairs for their dining room set. This reminded me of a fantasy that architect friend and college roommate, the late Professor Richard Rowe had. He wanted to see Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and Frank Lloyd Wright sit in chairs designed by the other architects and have them discuss design. Rowland concludes that the entire community, as envisioned by the original members of Usonia, together with Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural vision, created stability unparalleled in America in general. The well-designed homes contributed to stable marriages and families, and thus a stable community neighborhood. Many of the original members lived a long time in their homes, and many passed the houses on to the next generation. That is almost unheard of in America, except for perhaps some Amish communities. Much of that is lost today because families move on average every seven years. It's hard to appreciate the history of a place and to set down roots and make those human connections that create great neighborhoods. Rowland admits that he does not think something like Usonia could be done in today's world. So paraphrasing then the finale of the Learner and Low musical don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Usonia. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.